Good Monday morning to you. This is the Preterist Power Hour, our daily effort of bringing you an hour of power. Uh, this is a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. A great way to sum up our goal, our effort, is to bring forth clarity, healing, and strategy regarding the right understanding, the biblical understanding, if you will, of eschatology, the end time. So uh, that's our goal. Uh, I'm Mike Miano. I'm the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, the director of the Power of Preterism Network, and it's my privilege to be here with you uh, hosting, co-hosting these sessions with my brother Edward, who will introduce himself here in a moment. And Edward, if you don't mind, go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> my name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member of the Power of Preterism Network. And at this time, I would like to lead us in prayer. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, please go before us. Give us proper focus, uh, clarity of thought. And uh, that was presented today. We'll give clarity and, and empower those that are listening, as well as ourselves. And that uh, we're not here to uh, bring anyone down, but to encourage and strengthen and give clarity as we have been given clarity and we would like to uh, provoke conversation in, in uh, what will be spoken of today and fellowship will develop, you know, as we go along and faith will grow in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate that brother, because again, we read the apostle Paul says in first Corinthians 14 for all things to be done for the edification, right? To the building up of the church. Uh, I think that's important being that, uh, we do see a big divide in the Christian church in regards to the end times, right? We see this preterist futurist thing. And as you know, I recently taught in a Bible study, most futurists don't know they're futurists, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and they're, let's face it this way too. We've heard this in testimonies, most preterists or not most, but there's a lot of preterists that don't know they're preterists. They don't realize what they're saying and what they're teaching. So as you know, Edward, we've had these interviews with folks where They'll say things like, uh, you know, I was studying and I was seeing the consistency of what Jesus was saying about the time statements and uh, how the destruction of Jerusalem would ultimately be his coming uh, to that generation. And then they'll say things like, but I didn't know it was called preterism. So, you know, and I think that's good because that means that people are coming to the knowledge of truth without having a title qualifying it. And then a title is beneficial, you know, and sometimes we know it could be to our own frustration, just like in the larger Christian community. There's a lot of Christians that do things that some of us would not refer to or a large majority of us would not refer to as Christian. And in the preterist community, we have the same problem. We have many people who highlight details of preterism or talk about preterism, maybe even call themselves preterists, but don't identify with it the way that we would come to understand it. So. Uh, just for those that are tuning in, uh, preterism, and Edward, please jump in if you feel you want to further qualify this. Uh, preterism is the view that Bible prophecy was fulfilled in the past. Now, specifically, the way we've come to understand it, what we call full preterism or fulfilled covenant eschatology, is that when the Lord ended that old covenant by shattering the power of the holy people, the, the temple in Jerusalem, which he had said in Matthew 23, 24, uh, Mark 13, Luke 19, Luke 21, uh, all these different places, he identified that this would be the time of his coming. And again, uh, many of you might be familiar with the 101 time statements that are out there. Uh, there's a resource you can find where it shows you, Jesus said that that generation would be alive. Some standing in front of him would be alive at the time of his coming. So we've identified that in the first century, in our past, talking now in 2022, uh, in their future, because again, when Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica, they were still waiting for the coming of the Lord. Uh, we know that at the destruction of Jerusalem, that was the coming of the Lord, that was the resurrection of the dead, and that has brought about the glorious reality, the new Jerusalem, the new covenant, the new heavens and new earth that we now experience. What do you think, brother? I think that's awesome. I, I just would like to add that, you know, in making an out uh, a framework, an outside framework of what's going on as far as the fulfilled eschatology is that, okay, um, their future was the end because the temple was still standing. Now, once the temple went down and the city was destroyed, you know, all that was supposedly had to be fulfilled had to have been fulfilled at that particular time. 
which distinguishes from any other time because the temple was destroyed and the city was destroyed. So therefore, all that was prophesied that would happen at the end had to have occurred. So having that foundation, then you can put together, you know, all that has, you know, occurred and you can talk about, you know, everything, you know, from the raising of the dead, the sleep and the living changed and the burning up of the elements and all of those things, the millennium, you know, everything had to have occurred because it said it would happen at the end. That's right. If I may add a verse, matter of fact, to qualify something you just said, uh, if you go to Hebrews chapter nine, verses, I'm going to start at verse eight. And I, I want us to see, this is, this is what Edward was just highlighting here. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Again, this is when Paul was writing or whoever you believe was writing this letter to the Hebrew Christians. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about the gifts of the old covenant and how they could not clear the conscience until, which was the hope. Actually, matter of fact, let me just continue here, uh, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Now, again, I would highlight there the word body is talking about the corporate community. There were regulations given to old covenant Israel that could not perfect them. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4, uh, Galatians 3 and 4 for that matter, where he talks about what was the purpose of the law then? If the law can't make us perfect, what was the goal? And as you know, Edward, it tells us that the goal was to point to Jesus. You're a sinner. It was supposed to help you see the problem with an impure conscience and that with a perfect would only come through the Messiah who would be able to perfect our conscience. That's why, matter of fact, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.5, and he says, the goal of our faith is this, love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So it shows you the contrast of what Christ was bringing about, the new covenant, and that present time that Edward rightly pointed out was identified with the still standing temple. And also, we know we could go on and on about this, Edward, where one age, right, the Jewish age, the evil age, if you will, mm -hmm. The age that magnified sin, as I just highlighted from Galatians 3, that that evil age was a part of that temple system, that that temple represented the age, whereas the power of the holy people, as Daniel 12 calls it, and then the, the age to come, uh, the, the eternal age, if you will, was the age that would be signified by the eternal temple, which is Christ's people. And again, so much beautiful details that we could highlight in regards to what we're saying about preterism. Now, the reason why we started out uh, talking a bit about um, a bit about, you know, edifying the church and speaking the truth in love and, and those necessary things is because we want to get into some of the uh, the details today talking about, you know, we want to make sure we speak the truth in love, but we want to speak the truth. That's the thing we want to highlight as we watch debates and resources and conferences and live our Christian lives inter perfectly interacting with other people or even to be a bit more specific, what we're focused on right now in our uh, society with uh, Palm Sunday, you know, these Holy Week details of uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter, and Good Friday. When we come to understand what these details are talking about, uh, that, you know, the, it, it requires that we teach the truth in love, because again, a lot of people have erroneous views of the significance of Palm Sunday. Uh, as you know, Edward, I preached about yesterday morning here at the Blue Point Bible Church a lot. If you have an erroneous view of the kingdom of God, you have an erroneous view of what's happening with Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21, to name one text, of course. Um, then Good Friday, you know, the purpose of the cross. Edward, you've heard this, and we probably will talk about this a little bit today. Uh, have you heard people say it all was ended at the cross? Jesus yes. said it is finished. Mm -hmm. And then they tell you that's it. There's nothing else. No, they go on to talk about, you know, a resurrection, going to heaven, you know, all these other things. Jesus is going to come back. Well, wait a minute. Then why did he say it's finished at the cross? What's going on at the cross for him to say it is finished? And then why are there other things that are going to happen next? And 
I, I think a lot of people confuse that. Uh, I would say that, you know, I've, I've heard so many futurists, you know, those that believe that there's a, a yet future coming of Jesus, say it was all finished at the cross. And they'll because say that it's wrong. It's a misunderstanding and, and not uh, fully uh, studying the scripture That's as right. far as the sacrifice of the priests. When they, fit, when they completed the sacrifice, sacrifice, they would say it is finished. So that's that's exactly it, brother. You, you got it. You know, the, it's it's demonstrating that they don't have an understanding of what the point of the cross was. You know, most people, unfortunately, you know, this have been led to this understanding that Jesus died for you. And it's all about you going to heaven one day. Whereas, yes, the, Jesus did die for us. He died for his people. No doubt about that. But there's there's uh, other legs to that stool, so to speak. There's other details that need to be considered uh, when you're understanding that doctrine. For example, what, why did somebody need to die? That was an issue. You know, I've shared my testimony uh, many times for me. The issue for me coming to the Christian faith was not understanding why somebody that I didn't ask needed to do something for me that I didn't know I even needed uh, or why it's needed. Uh, that was a problem. And again, we haven't given people proper context. Uh, and then there's those that claim to be teachers that are either ignoring context or just propagating the system that they're comfortable with that becomes problematic. So, you know, that's the cross. And then, of course, the resurrection. Uh, you know, uh, there's so much based upon Christ's resurrection. Matter of fact, next Sunday, I'm going to be teaching from 1 Corinthians 15 here at our church because the Apostle Paul says, as an argument to the Corinthians who did believe in his physical resurrection, he turns to them and says, well, if you don't believe that there's a resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. But they already believed in the physical resurrection. Mm -hmm. And that's something people need to catch the, the, the point of, uh, is why Paul was making that argument to the Corinthian church that if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. So do I have it right in this regard, as far as uh, Christ having to be that sacrifice, is that it, it all like, started like with Adam when he sinned, and he, he and Eve, and God made the first blood sacrifice and covered their, covered their, sh their shame with animal skins. That was the first sacrifice. Then I, from then on, there were sacrifices because without sacrifice, there could be no remission of sin. So That's therefore, right. you know, God was not pleased fully, you know, with the animal sacrifices because they still had that, they were still under that condemnation. They still, you know, the, the Lord did not take away their, their feeling of being condemned, you know, so they had to do it yearly you know, stuff like that. So Christ uh, in fulfillment of the Old Testament, he was that one sacrifice for all. That's right. You know, That's so. right. Matter of fact, that we mentioned the book of Hebrews, I'm pretty sure <laughs> the writer there gets in on that, that whereas the old covenant system, again, let's qualify, the book of Hebrews is highlighting the better realities of the new covenant in contrast to the old covenant. That's the transition that the New Testament is concerned with. So uh, in the book of Hebrews, I believe the writer does say that uh, in contrast to doing it year after year, uh, they would do, you know, Christ died once and for all. It was finished at the cross. But then, as you know, Edward, just as the book of Hebrews highlights for us, that that wasn't it. Yes, the sacrifice has been offered. It is finished in that regard. The telestai has been pronounced. That's what it is finished in the Greek. Uh, telestai is what the priest may offer up uh, the words. Uh, that the, 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 I don't know if that's Greek, matter of fact, but either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's just me showing a little bit of information that I know. <laughs> um, that being said, what we do know is that the high priest then goes into the, the tabernacle, the high holy place and the most holy place, pours the blood all over these items and then returns. And there's this sort of two-part process, which we see beautifully with the death, burial, resurrection and ascension of Christ, and then his coming in AD 70, which again is reflected by Hebrews 9.28, that he would come a second time to bring salvation, uh, which again, the shattering of that old covenant temple surely signified salvation to those who have trusted in Jesus Christ. So may I ask, at the cross, was a, uh, atonement uh, accomplished? No. So okay. again, atonement, in order for atonement to be accomplished, that high priest has to come out a second time. Right, so, right. You know, uh, the, the high priest would go in, you, you know, again, you've heard that question asked to preterist a lot of times because of um, penal substitutionary atonement is a doctrine that's found very much in reformed communities. And uh, what penal substitutionary atonement is saying is that on the cross, Christ took your place, which is not erroneous. However, I did want to say something before um, 
well, let me just continue that thought. Uh, the sacrifice is only effectual in that the high priest completes the work. If the high priest, let's say he goes in the first time and doesn't come out, well, then you need a whole new high priest. We need to start this process over. So atonement was a means of process. And again, I think that's a big problem that a lot of Christians have not come to understand the process, if you will, that's happening through scripture, what God was doing through the old, why he was doing that through the old, and then ultimately what he's manifesting through the new. So it kind of all needs to, it's important to consider the process. It's sort of like the difference between Bible texts and biblical narrative. You know, there's biblical texts that are important and should be highlighted, yes, but they only really find their place, their proper place in the biblical narrative. So Jesus being the high priest, he had to go through the priestly uh, process. That's right. Of completing his uh, sacrifice. That's right. I heard some teachers say it like this, Christ left the earthly robes. You know, you read the story there of his resurrection and what's there in the tomb, the robes. So Christ left his earthly robes and put on his heavenly robes to do his heavenly work. He already did the earthly work. So, you know, there's a beautiful comparison there. Uh, matter of fact, it was Alan Bondar years ago who used to, uh, who had a great teaching on the changing of clothing, uh, Christ's changing of clothing and ultimately his people's changing of clothing. We have, we've been given clean garments, right? You read in a, uh, revelation about we've been given a white robe a beautiful robe you, you know a yeah. change of garments there uh, representing salvation so amen we put on interruption and we put on immortality as well that's right that's right so you know today uh, again this is our daily program uh sometimes we we have guests As a matter of fact tomorrow morning we're going to have reese maggard joining with us uh, one of the uh conference speakers at the recent rethinking the resurrection conference and um we had Steve Bazin with us last week talking about his recent debate with Steve Whitsett. So we've had a lot of resources that we uh, kind of been pondering. And I know, Edward, you had spent some time this weekend going through uh, my previous debate with Steve Whitsett back in 2016. And then uh, obviously the most recent debate he had with uh, Steve Bazin. So I thought maybe we'd do some discussion about that and kind of lean in on that topic, as that's something that's sort of fresh in my mind uh, as I kind of pondered problems, if you will, and advancements yes. of preterism. Amen. Sound good to you, brother? Yes. All right. So that being said, now, I mentioned, I want to say this, I mentioned that it's important for us to go back to these debates and start marking out times and, and places where things are said that need to be marked out. Because uh, what you're noticing, and you probably noticed this, is you get a whole lot of, I didn't say that, or I didn't, you know, it, well, yes, you did. I, I can mark out the time that you said it. Now, if you didn't say it the way you intended it, that's a different point. But then the, the point is when you're preparing for a debate, you're getting ready to go speak in front of people, especially on the internet, have some thoughts prepared and don't have an excuse every time you get caught up in a, a snag, if you will, with, well, that wasn't what I meant or I didn't get my full thought out. Well, make sure you can when you do public pre presentation. One of my pet peeves, if you will, Edward, uh, and this might sound mean-spirited. Matter of fact, some of the things I say today may sound mean-spirited. If you know me, that's not my spirit. However, I do believe there's a time for the minister to teach the truth that, you know, uh, what does Titus say in Titus 1.9, I believe it is? Uh, teach, the, teach the saint sound doctrine and rebuke those who oppose it. So, you know, when I hear these constant contradictions, especially Steve Whitsett, uh, you know, things come to mind that need to be dealt with. And um, I lost my train of thought there. but. Uh, Oh, I was going to say something about sounding mean-spirited, a pet peeve of mine. I do want to get it out. Let it, let's get it recorded here. Um, you have conferences. And a lot of times you have conference speakers that will go forward and will say things like this. Well, I have a lot here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through it. Well, what have you been doing for the past four months? You know, that, that's the goal. When you do a presentation, you prepare for a presentation, prepare. It's not just about having the right things to say. It's about being able to say it effectually and being able to say it within the time parameters that are going to be given to you. So, you know, that's that's important. Uh, it's just as important, you know, you show up to a job interview. It's not just about having experience and being there. It's about showing up on time. And, and you know, so there's, I just think that's important and I'm glad you let me get that off my chest. <laughs> um, that being it's said- a wonderful, think, It's a wonderful point. It is brother, it is. It's, it's, it's re respectful, respectful of people's time. And it shows that you put the effort in to, you know, make things organized, to make, you know, to help edify people. Uh, one of the things I, you know, me and Steve Bazden, we talked about with the Steve Whitsett debate, it does seem as though Steve Whitsett just sort of shows up with the same arguments that he had in last debate, 
Meanwhile, he was proven wrong. And then maybe he borrows uh, arguments from other people. Futurists are not united. So for one futurist to get insights from another futurist sometimes gets us into more conundrums than we think. Uh, for example, Sam Frost and Steve Whitsett's views, which are both opposed to each other. However, they try to create this false unity of, you know, and I think we lend to that by calling them futurists. Whereas what we need to say is people have the Bible distorted and confused and they're, they're all over the place. They're not, you know, they're not united. These people that believe that Jesus is coming in the future. If you do the research, I have mentioned this so many times, but I'm going to mention it again. I sat at a, a, a table here locally of all, most of our local ministers, our, the Pentecostal persuasion for the most part. Uh, and I sat around a, a table of about 30 of us, 30 to 40 preachers. And we went around the table, each man telling where he believes we are in the last days. And my brother, everybody said something different. Everybody. So that should trouble us. Uh, again, there was, I was the only preterist in the room and I decided to sit that discussion out uh, many reasons and it led to much fruit. Uh, however, um, that, you know, again, so the futurist community is not united. So to sit there and say, for example, the Steve Whitsett kept saying during his debates with me and with Steve Bazden, we, we believe, who's the we? And I think I've come to notice that Steve Whitsett's we is him, himself, and I that it's not necessarily a community behind him. There's not necessarily agreement. And I did want to say, you know, Steve Whitsett did make a video responding to me. If you go to his uh, YouTube, I don't usually refer people uh, to his YouTube, but he has recently put up some videos where he has against Michael Miano or a response to Michael Miano. And he kind of mocked our program here. He called it the preterist power failure hour. Uh, so <laughs> uh, there, there's your uh, encouragement, Edward. Um, but, you know, again, just... Just to notice, I don't want to have that spirit, but I am going to call things out when they need to be called out. So uh, I was kind of hoping we'll have that moment this morning. Before I go any further, Edward, I just want to share two quotes. The first one is a quote I shared from Gary DeMar this past week, and it's an encouraging thought. Now, for those of you that know, Gary DeMar is not an avowed or professed full preterist for that matter. Uh, however, listen to the words that he said. There's a major shift taking place in eschatology in the broader Christian community. If the shift takes hold, we could see a major change in the way Christians understand eschatology. Now, that's a brief quote out of a larger detail he was making. Uh, however, he was saying that somebody asked me on social media, is that a positive change? And yes, uh, I believe that what Gary's highlighting there is that we're seeing a positive change, a major positive shift, if you will take place in the Christian community. Why? I think it's clear. When you go to the Christian bookstores and you look at the book, the book aisles, you'll notice there's this odd um, abundance, if you will, of writings that say things like, this is how the first century writers understood it. The first century study Bible, uh, N.T. Wright recently uh, published, uh, the New Testament in its own world. Um, there's an abundance of audience relevance based topics. People realize when you listen to the preachers around you, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They're pulling quotes out of all over the place, leaning on each other's misunderstandings, uh, you, you know, all over. People are starting to realize, and I think the big question becomes, well, how would these people 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, understand the details that were written to them uh, and that were in their culture? How would they have applied to their culture? And I'm excited that we're seeing that shift. And that's what I believe Gary DeMar is getting at, uh, that if that shift takes hold, imagine that that Christians across the board, post-millennial, pre-millennial, amillennial, I don't know what millennium I'm living in, whatever view they're, they're in, uh, imagine if they all begin, if everybody at one time began to say, well, yeah, how can we, maybe we need to just go back to what it meant to the people in the first century and start there. That doesn't mean that we're removing application for ourselves today, but let's start there and at least understand what it meant and then decide what proper application is. And I believe as Gary DeMar saying, if that shift takes hold, we could see a major change in the way Christians understand eschatology. What do you think, brother? I think that's awesome. <laughs> Praise God, but, right? Uh, yes. But unfortunately, Steve, Steve Wood said, uh, said in his debate, uh, I believe it could have been with uh, Steve Bazin. He has said um, uh, audience relevance is not a good hermeneutic, which it is, it is the foundation of understanding scripture is how the first century people would have understood it, how the author or 
of the book intended it to be understood and also, you know, the purpose of the message, what was going on at the cult during that time, the culture and all these aspects is very important, you know, to get understanding of the context of what the, what the actual book or scripture is saying, you know, and once we get the, the proper context and then we can possibly see how it may apply to us and how we could possibly use it. That's right. Yeah. Again, I was baffled and I, as much as you were, I think it was right in his opening statement with the recent debate with Steve Baisden that Steve Whitsett went on to, and he does this in every debate. Uh, this is one of my first notes that I actually wanted to bring up. When Steve Whitsett seems to get in front of a larger group than he's normally speaking to, what he wants to do is take on the role of a teacher. And he wants to bring you back to the basics. So if you watch my debate with him, the first thing he did when he got up there was he began to talk about dispensationalism and preterism and his confused theory of middleism. Uh, we'll get to that here in the program. And then he, he tries to, you know, put on this air of a teacher. That way, you know, you look to him like he must be the wise guy that has two church history textbooks that he keeps flaunting around. So, uh, you, you know, that that's what he's endeavoring to do. So he did the same thing with the Steve Whitsett debate where, uh, right, I mean, sorry, with the Steve Bazden debate right away at the very beginning. He, he goes on to get into these details about proper hermeneutics. And I was baffled as much as you are, Edward, that he said, uh, you know, audience relevance is not a, and catch him in this. I want to encourage everyone, go with the debate for that alone is worth noting that this man who professes to be a Bible teacher went ahead and said that audience relevance is not a hermeneutical principle. Now, what he's probably going to say is that it wasn't listed in whatever textbook or whatever resource he was using, which is fine. But to simply say, again, it, it doesn't make good nonsense. I forget who I'm borrowing that from. I think it's uh, Dr. Don K. Preston. All right. It is a Don K. Prestonism. Good deal. So, uh, you know, it doesn't make good nonsense to say that. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, it just doesn't make About hermeneutics. right audience relevance to say that you're not supposed to consider what it meant to the original audience. Come on now. Come on now. So matter of fact, I mentioned Don Preston. I wanted to bring up a quote by him that leads me into another point uh, problem with Steve Whitsett's view. Don says this, it is patently illogical to claim that all of God's promises to Israel have been fulfilled and that all types and shadows of the law have been fulfilled and still hold to a futurist eschatology, end quote. Now, if you notice, Steve Whitsett, Steve Whitsett does this. What he wants to do is he wants to teach you preterism, teaches that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. No, history teaches you that, not preterism. History teaches you that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. So now history teaches you that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. The preterist is saying that was the fulfillment of Jesus's words, where Jesus said that that generation would not pass away until they seen these things happen, Matthew 24, 34. Uh, that where Jesus said that when he pointed, he, he pronounced judgment upon the Jews in Matthew 23, and his disciples immediately come up to him saying, when will these things be? The judgment upon them. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? They qualify all three of these being synonymous with the judgment that he said was going to come upon the Jews in that time. So, you know, that's the point. He's qualifying that coming. He's and That's what we're saying as preterists, that the coming of the Lord, the culmination of Bible prophecy was going to take place at the shattering of the temple. And now in Daniel 12, Daniel tells us what also happens at the shattering of the power of the holy people. Edward, do you, do you know what I'm leading in on there? Uh... Daniel 12, the shattering of the power of the holy people, it says the dead are going to rise, right? So that now that my point is, is we're saying the coming of the Lord, this is what preterists are saying. History says, I want us to qualify this appropriately here. History says the temple was destroyed in AD 7. The preterist says that that was the coming of the Lord as per the things of God, not history. That's what we're saying. The theology of it was. That, that was the coming of the Lord. That was the judgment upon that generation that Christ prophesied. And also what was happening at that time as per theology is the resurrection of the dead. What was promised through the old covenant. So that cataclysmic event, the shattering of the temple in AD 70 was yes, a historical event, but also a spiritual event. That's what preterism is getting at. Now, Steve Whitsett wants to say, well, I, I believe that. 
I believe that that was, I, I can't quite figure out if he believes it was a coming, if he doesn't believe it was a coming. He keeps going back to the Greek <clears throat> word epineia to say that that is the word for appearance, but I'm not talking about the appearance. I'm talking about the coming that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 through 28, that some would see his coming in the clouds with the angels to bring reward to every man according to what he has done. And Edward, it shouldn't surprise folks that in order to give somebody a reward, they have to be alive. They have to be resurrected. So that's the point. Matthew 16, 27 through 28 is getting at the coming and the resurrection, which is also highlighted in Revelation chapter 22. And then Matthew 24, again, another clear text. All those prophecies would be fulfilled, which includes the gathering of the people of God, which is a text highlighted in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 15, that the people would be brought together to be with the Lord forever. That's the goal of Bible prophecy. And to continue to qualify what you're saying about the raising of the dead and, and the rewards and all of these things is that <clears throat> when the temple went down and the end had occurred, um, the, prophes the prophecies, the physical prophecies uh, had given time statements of, as far as you know, there would not be one stone upon another. Some of them standing will still be alive all of these various physical things that had occurred would allow you to see spiritually the spiritual things that had occurred. Mm -hmm. That's you right. Know, by right. seeing the physical things that was prophesied occurred. So the spiritual, spiritual things had to have occurred. You know, we're seeing it through the preterist lens, but also the scripture is kind of telling us that as well, but you have to have the spiritual eyes to see it. Amen, amen. Yeah, you know, again, so understanding the coming of the Lord and the resurrection is a big part of understanding New Testament eschatology, understanding what your Bible is actually getting at, the goal of it all. So um, there, there was something else I wanted to bring us back to. Um, you fast, I wanted to give another statement that Dr. Don K. Preston had uh, posed a question. He has said, does physical death, um, does physical death, does physical death, is, is physical death an enemy mm. of the child of God? Right. The reason why he had posed that question was because people like um, uh, Steve Whitsett has stated that physical death is a result of sin. So if that's the case, if, if you pass from death to life by believing in Christ, why do we still physically die? You know, that's, you know, it, it just doesn't uh, fit in that regard. Yeah, you're right. What most people, and you know this, most people are missing, uh, a lot of people that are arguing against what we're saying, are missing the fact that there's three different groups of people that are being qualified in resurrection texts. And you know, I regularly teach this. There's those that would be alive. There's those that would be asleep. And there's those that are dead. Those three different groups of people. Now, again, there's a difference between being alive biologically and being alive spiritually. There's a difference between being dead biologically and being dead covenantally. I don't want to use the word spiritually there. Um, so what I'm saying is that the living were the physically alive people. They were going to be people that were going to be physically alive, whether you were a believer or a non-believer, whether you're alive spiritually or not alive spiritually, there would be people that were living. Yes. And then we believe there were people that were asleep. Now, the only way I've come to understand now, there's a couple of texts that get a little strange. It seems as though in the Old Testament, they would talk about the covenant people sleeping. But then you also have texts in the Old Testament that say when you go to Hades or when you're in the grave, there's no thinking, no, you know, no eating, no anything, no, no praying, no knowing God or hearing anything. So for me, that has led me. In, and again, this is not just something that's lost on us. Uh in the old covenant system, there were two different views. Uh, Josephus took on the view, the more Hellenized view, in my opinion, that the Hadean realm had two different places, Abraham's bosom and the place of torments, which is again reflected through what is actually a parable, the rich man and Lazarus. If you look into the Babylonian Talmud, you'll notice that there's a very similar parable to the rich man and Lazarus that was, that was being based upon. So there, that lent to this idea 
that there was an actual difference in Hades of different beings. But what that would have required was the immortality of the soul, uh, that there was something living in these two different realms. I think, again, as you know, I've taught that that was a conceptual reality, that if you died in favor with God, you were seen as being in Abraham's bosom. Did anybody know? No. Why not? Because the judgment hadn't happened yet. So there was no way for anybody to know. And so you would go to Hades. That, that's, again, why I have a problem with the distinct places. How do you have somebody in a different place, Abraham's bosom or in uh, the torments before the judgment? Doesn't make sense. And not only that, um, you don't have everlasting life until Christ gives it to you. That's right. Exactly. So you have people living in you know, somehow living outside of their biological existence in these places, which doesn't make sense. So it doesn't work. Now, my, uh, my point in bringing that up, um, I don't know why I'm losing my train of thought today. I guess the coffee's not doing okay. its job. Um, either way, I'll find it. I'll, I'll get back to it. But what we're seeing with the, uh, the rich man of Lazarus, a parable, you know, that there's these two different places. Oh, my point being that uh, the sleep, I was just highlighting. I see you got to go, brother. Yeah. All right. Hey, get out of here. I'm going to finish my thought and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll listen and follow up with me tomorrow. Yes. All right. Good deal, brother. Go in peace. God bless you. Thank you. My point being here that what we're talking about with the living, the dead, the asleep and the dead is that the asleep in scripture are those that have put their faith in Christ, especially in the New Testament. They are those that have put their faith in Christ. They have gone from death to life. However, the resurrection, the judgment, these eschatological details have not yet happened. Therefore, they're asleep, waiting for that time. What time? The resurrection of the dead, the coming of the Lord, which again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 gets to. What will happen to the asleep? Well, they'll, they'll precede the living and be, come with the Lord in his coming. They'll be woken up and come with him. Then the question in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, of course, is, well, what about the dead ones? Where do... The, the, the dead ones go? What happens to them? Are they raised? Is there a resurrection of the dead? And there were some in that first century period that decided to try to deny that there would be a resurrection of the dead ones, which again, has nothing to do with the living. The living are the people that are biologically alive. They are not the dead ones. The people that are asleep are not the dead ones. The dead ones are the old covenant dead that did not have opportunity to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what the resurrection of the dead is getting at. That is that unseen event that was being seen through the physical events of the destruction of the temple. As per, of course, Daniel chapter 12 and Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, the host of other texts that would be brought into that conversation. So that's, you know, that's kind of where I think some things need to get uh, under, be understood. Again, highlighting that quote that Don Preston had said that, you know, it's impossible to say that all things were fulfilled for Israel, which again, resurrection hope was their, their hope. Uh, that that was fulfilled for Old Covenant Israel, and then to say that there's still things that are being yet waited for, the coming of the Lord, the resurrection of the dead. It doesn't make good nonsense. But again, neither does saying things like audience relevance uh, has no place in the Bible uh, or has no place in Bible study and hermeneutics. Uh, so again, frustrating stuff. I want to encourage you. I put a blog up on our uh, preterism website, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, a blog in regards to the recent debate with Steve Bazden and Steve Whitsett. And I shared some notes with you that I'm just going to go ahead and uh, remind you of here now, but I want to encourage you to go back to the blog as you can get resources in regards to the debate, the debate I had with Steve Whitsett back in 2016. Uh, then you can also find uh, some articles that were shared. Uh, two particular articles were uh, my article on resurrection, which is actually something I wrote coming out of the debate uh, with Steve Whitsett in 2016. It's called Replacing the Resurrection, Consider the Confusion, and Finding Clarity in Scripture. And then Steve Whitsett responded with How Does Mike Miano Replace the Resurrection? And then I also provided some other links for you from the Power of Preterism site, where we have an article on the same hope as these men, where Paul said, I have the same hope as these men, talking about the Pharisees. And then, of course, an article from Larry Siegel uh, regarding resurrection, God's purpose of the ages. Now, going back up on that blog to my notes, some of the things I marked out from the recent Steve Bazden debate uh, with Steve Whitsett were the fact that Steve Bazden, he again, he made some good points. He said that uh, if I'm alive now, what am I going to be resurrected from in the future? And that's what Edward was just sort of getting at in that regard, is that if we're re resurrected, we don't need to die and be resurrected again. 
Wits had started out, we talked about this, detailing the uh, detailing uh, audience relevance and how there's it doesn't have a place in scripture. He continually refers to the book as revelations uh, numerous times. He, he argues on a recent video that he doesn't do that, but if you go back and listen to the debates, you'll notice it for yourself. I might encourage you to write down the times that it's done, because again, here's a man that does it on video and yet says that he doesn't do it. And that's not that big of a deal. Everybody seems to make that uh, error here and there. However, if you're on a debate, if you're in a debate and you're on public forum here, add value to the public forum by saying things that need to be said, especially issues that Christians by and large get mixed up. Get them right. Say them right so people can understand. And uh, he, he obviously put the, the saints in AD 30, uh, the old covenant saints, he has them in, in heaven by AD 33, uh, which again would make him more of a Hymenaean heresy than the full preterist community is often erroneously referred to as. Uh, and he constantly refers to these things about Facebook. You know, he's arguing, which again, uh, makes my point that I made the other day talking to Steve Bazden that, you know, this guy has no relevance out, outside of Facebook and social media. Uh, and that's why most of his arguments are uh, based upon things he's seeing on social media. Uh, I actually gave you the times, if you go to the blog, if you go to the minute 29, 20 seconds, uh, I think that's where he gets in on saying that there's no audience relevance, has no place in scripture, uh, 30, minute 31, minute 41, 14 seconds. Again, I think it's important for us to take note of these things, uh, where they're being said in these debates. At the hour two, verse uh, minute 18 uh, point, if you did the grueling work of going through this three-hour debate, you can catch Steve Whitsett say this, sorry, the fullness of the deity does not dwell in the church. This is odd because, and Steve Whitsett, uh, Steve Bazden called it out. I want to go ahead and take you over to Colossians. We're going to look at Colossians 1 and 2 and Ephesians 1 through 3. And then I'll just make one more point about this and open up for some discussion if anybody wants to add to some of the things that I've said so far this morning, or that Edward said for that matter. Uh, here in Colossians chapter 2, let's start there because this is where it seems the confusion is happening. Notice what it says. I'm going to start at verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Who's this talking about? This is talking about the church of Colossae. So they've been instructed in Christ. They've received Christ. They walk with Christ. They've been firmly rooted. They're being built up. And they're being established in their faith. Notice that. This is the apostles, or the apostle Paul particularly, writing to the saints at Colossae. Just read Colossians 1, verses 1 through 2. So see to it, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now, if you've done the study through, uh, what is it, 2 Peter chapter 3, a text Don Preston has written a book on, uh, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Uh, we know that the elements, when you read of this phrase, stoikion in the Greek, that it's oftentimes pointing back to the old covenant law, the legal, the, the Judaizers that were coming into these assemblies and disrupting the work that the apostle Paul was doing. That's what's being alluded to here. And of course, there were other deceptions that began to creep in. There was a sort of a docetism that Christ did not exist in the flesh. Uh, there was a proto-Gnosticism that the physical things were bad. Uh, these were things that were happening in this period of time. But notice, again, this is an encouragement to the church to be built up. Now watch this. See to it that no one takes you captive. I read that verse, sorry. Verse 9. For in him, Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removing of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, but bodily form, this is the text that seems to be disrupting uh, some of these debates, that all the fullness of God dwells in Christ in bodily form. And then they'll argue with you and say that Christ, we're saying that Christ no longer has a body. Then how does the, uh, that, and then how does the fullness of God dwell in his body? Well, look at this. Verse 11, it says that you were circumcised without hands, the removing of the body. These Colossians have bodies. They're individual people with individual physical bodies. 
They're in the church, which is called the body of Christ. Then what body was removed? Again, the word soma, identity, their old covenant identity was removed. Now let's go to verse nine. For in him, the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, meaning Christ is the identity of God. He is the image of the invisible God. It's a phrase that's made in other places by the apostle Paul. That's all that's being said here, that Christ is the image. Don't let other men deceive you by having you move away from the truth of Christ by empty philosophy or empty deception and hollow philosophies. That was what he's teaching here. This has nothing to do with Christ being in a physical body and the, the fullness of God living in his physical body. Rather, this is talking about the identity of God being found in Christ. There's some that are trying to get you to move away from Christ, but continue being rooted up in Christ because you've moved away from that old covenant body. You've moved away from that other identity. And why is this so important? Because here in Colossians chapter one, this is the text that Steve uh, Bazin had brought up in the debate. Verse 24, Colossians 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might carry out the preaching of the word of God. Did you catch it? The body that's being talked about here is the body of Christ. It's where the identity of God, the presence of God can be found. And this is an encouragement to the church of Colossae and the other churches, as most of these letters were read throughout the other churches, for them to be that embodiment of God's presence. In, now, again, this was in response to what Steve Whitsett said, that, sorry, the fullness of the deity does not dwell in the church. Well, that's strange. Let's go ahead and look at Colossi uh, Ephesians chapter 1, where we read that directly, that the fullness of God dwells in the church. Again, this was an argument brought up by Steve Whitsett, to, which he's very known for doing, to sort of rebuff the, the good points that were being made against him. Here in Ephesians chapter 1. Let's take a look at verse, let's start at verse 13. Matter of fact, I'm just going to have us, you can read the whole text and it makes the point for me, but I'm going to have us go to 18 and I'm going to read through to verse 23. I pray that the eyes, this is the apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, tell, encouraging them. Listen to what he says. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? So now notice so far, the only way you're going to see this, I, again, I, maybe I can understand Steve Whitsett's confusion here. Uh, he says that the fullness of God is not in the church. Well, the only way that you're going to come to see that is by the eyes of your heart being enlightened so that you will know. Continuing into verse 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? The church. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, of which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So again, God's power, God's might, the fullness of God, raised Christ from the dead. Now notice what it says. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. Now, notice this last verse, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Do you see the problem here, folks? <laughs> That's what these texts are getting at. But Steve Bazden or Steve Whitset, sorry about that. Steve Whitset wants to make it about a physical body with physical strength of God a physical glory or some sort of other physical, but not physical glorified as he wants to maybe put it. That is not what the scriptures are teaching and it's problematic. So then this brings me to my last point. When we go through these debates, you, I'm sure many of you have noticed this. We make these scriptural points and then they always end up to this new thing where two, two common uh, ways I've been rebuffed in this manner is, well, why doesn't everybody else believe this? Well, again, just to use what I just read to you from Ephesians, the apostle, as a matter of fact, in Ephesians 3, the apostle Paul goes on to make the same point about how the church is the manifestation of the wisdom of God. 
Uh, this is what God has been doing all the way from the beginning of your Bible. When you go back to Deuteronomy 4, the whole reason why God has, you're reading the five books of Moses is because God, because God wants his people to be a reflection of his wisdom and understanding. So that's the goal of the Bible, for his people to be a reflection of him. That was the hope of Israel. That's the resurrection. That's, that's what this is all about. Now, what ends up happening is, so then that, that first one, why doesn't everybody else believe it? Well, maybe they're not spiritually discerned. That, that would be my simple answer there. And then the other one is, well, why didn't the church fathers believe it? Now, this is where I wanted to end our program today. And this is ultimately what I wanted to lead in on, was uh, Steve Whitsett made a video recently kind of mocking Edward and I's recent discussion about these things and also our discussion on church history. What we're doing here at the Blue Point Bible Church every Saturday morning, and yes, it's not every morning, he kind of mocked that, that we're not doing it every day, but every Saturday morning, we're meeting together and we're spending time, as much time as we need, going by generation, every 40 years, and picking out historical writings, marking out the social atmosphere, and trying to understand the history of the church in that way. We're using two textbooks, two texts that I used when I went to Bible college. One's The Story of Christianity by Justo Gonzalez, and the other is Church History in Plain Language by Bruce Shelley. Uh, we're also using a lot of internet resources, any links that we can come across that we can add to our study. Again, and we're spending time in these 40-year periods. We've been, matter of fact, in the period of 110 to 150 uh, for the last four weeks. And we're going to stay there for quite some time because it was at that point where we began to see a lot of apologists writing uh, to their generation about the Christian details. Now they'll change from time to time because the arguments in society change from time to time. And uh, the things we're arguing about in 2022 in the Christian community are not the things they were arguing about in the Christian community in 1865. So, uh, and especially now you consider location. Uh, the things that we're talking about in 2022 in the Christian community in America are not the things that the people of uh, Romania were talking about in the year 1868. Now, don't get me all caught up on, I could already see some folks saying, well, Romania wasn't around in 18. That's not my point. Hopefully you see what I'm getting at here that you know, the conversations change. And what we see in 110 to 150 is the conversation changes. One of my charges against Steve Whitsett and against the futurist community that constantly uses the church fathers to try to bolster their claims is that the church fathers were speaking to their generations about a lot of times issues in their generation using details from the scriptures that were applying to their generation. And then you have men today in our generation borrowing from their generation rather than the scriptural generation and confusing things. The historic church was not as unified on these things as we would like to believe. Uh, do the research. There's a difference between reading the church fathers, quoting the church fathers, holding up books and videos versus actually interacting with those details. So I want to encourage everyone, if you want to talk about the church fathers, that's great, but interact with them. If you want to, again, I don't really like the title church fathers, uh, I think the, the right title might be the, the, the church, you know, the beginning uh, founders of the church, the beginning leaders of the church, uh, because again, uh, they're no more fathering the gospel than the men of God and women of God are today. And uh, so I want to encourage interaction with the church history uh, in the right way, not citation and not just going over and borrowing quotes, but actually interacting with the church history, if you want to use that as your stand on why, you know, why does Christianity look this way? Why are there so many divides? Uh, where was Christianity unified in church history and so forth? Matter of fact, uh, that gives me opportunity to mention a resource. Uh, on the Blue Point Bible Church, we've been putting up our study, uh, giving you a sort of the outline that we use in our discussions, and uh, I'll make them available. I believe we're up to church history part three, so I have to update you and make get part four and part, part five updated, and what I'll probably do, being that I'm talking about it here on this program, is I'll post it on the Power of Preterism Network uh, WordPress site. I'll give the part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. Uh, however, I will end on this point. The work is going to be up to you. Just like those that come to our study on Saturday morning, I tell them, you know, if you go home and you, you just do what we do here, and then you go home and you don't do research, you don't do the reading and the leaning, and, and really thinking these th things through, maybe talking with your husband, your wife, your friend about these things, you're not going to get the true benefit that you need. These things are understood in community, and uh, they're done by interacting with the history rather than just pulling out and citing. So I pray that was edifying this morning. I'll look forward to putting on another blog on the internet uh, in that regard. And I'm going to go ahead and start unmuting some mics for conversation. If anyone has something to say. Sometimes I feel as if I'm unmuting and I'm forcing folks into conversation. Don't feel forced. 
Vicky, I see you're unmuted. You have something you want to share? Yes, I don't understand the word. It is finished, but I will uh, I I will discuss with you in in person at the church. Thank you so okay. much. You're very welcome. If I may just lean in on that, uh, what I will say is that the word, uh, whether it's you know I, I forget if telestai is Greek or Hebrew, it doesn't quite matter. Uh, however, uh, what the high priest would do when they were offering the sacrifice on the day of atonement is. They would, and it, this might be a bit graphic, I'm sorry, but it, that's, it was graphic. Uh, they would slit the throat of the sacrifice and let it bleed out. And okay. at that moment, when they did that, they would say, it is finished, which what they were understanding was that at that moment, the sins of the people were being placed upon that sacrifice. And okay. now that that sacrifice is finished, now the high priest has to go about the next part of his work, which is carrying the blood of that sacrifice into the temple, into the tabernacle. Okay. Does that make sense? Is there, what, do you want to maybe but, let me know what part doesn't make sense to you? Yes, but what it has to do with Jesus dying on the cross. Well, Jesus said it is finished on the cross. Oh, he said That's, that, okay. Oh, yes, so, so if I may. He say, he say that it is finished. It's, it's the same as the high priest doing this cutting the throat of the animals and go into the into the into the where into the the temple or the tabernacle the most holy okay. place or the holy place for that matter so, so but this procedure is not good enough for salvation he has to come the second time right well that's what hebrews nine twenty eight says right okay so when he comes he just appear in in um he just uh, appear in the cloud and and this this period is called he come in judgment that's all right well i i don't know i would say that's all i think there's a lot into it but uh it was the judgment the coming the resurrection the parousia the the vindication of oh, the mark okay. there's millions of things we can put upon that event i i like to talk to you in person and i'm going to write it down okay, okay please do I, I appreciate that you uh, brought that up. One of my ways that I often teach and exhort folks is to write things down, you know, write these things down. You know, you're in the middle of a study, uh, somebody saying something that doesn't stand out to you. And, you know, I don't tell people to do things I don't do myself. So those of you that know me a bit more intimately know I take notes on everything, uh, even sometimes just average conversation. So thank you, Vicki. Well, I appreciate that. To say, I have to say every day I learn and every time I I. I... I went to church. I always learn. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you for being diligent and attentive. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. I did want to qualify uh, something Vicky had brought up there uh, in regards to the, um, the confusion that happens. So with these preterist futurist debates, if you will, what, let's face it, first off, there's ego. We have to kill the ego. The ego really has to die. We have to, I think we can pray that every day. Amen. We can pray with the Apostle Paul. I die daily. And, you know, let's, let's ask that we would do that. that we, dying to ourselves represents dying to our own demands, what we thought we knew yesterday, what we thought we knew five minutes ago, and being willing to wrestle with truth, being willing to seek, search, study, and prove. That's the way I've been teaching uh, the sanctified Christ in your heart that you read in 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, that's most people focus on the always be ready to give an answer. However, the first part of that text is sanctify Christ in your heart. So I would dare say that we need to be doing that before we're endeavoring to give an answer. Too many folks are giving an answer and not doing that. So uh, seek, search, study, and prove the things of God. And uh, my, my point being with the debates, what will happen is things will get kind of confusing in these debates, any of you that are watching them. Uh, and even the, the participants end up being a bit perplexed by the arguments that are being brought up. And one of them that often gets brought up is the futurist. Again, the futurist is the person that's arguing for things to be fulfilled in the past, in the future. And the preterist who says, no, no, the necessary things to be fulfilled were fulfilled in the past. All of a sudden, we'll find ourselves arguing with a futurist who says, well, everything was finished at the cross. Well, no, or everything pertaining to salvation was finished at the cross because Jesus said it is finished, which is a very elementary understanding of what Jesus is actually saying there. It's actually not even elementary. It's erroneous because the obvious would be Jesus said that the old covenant law, that the, the, the sin that was being magnified by the old covenant law would not be done away 
until every jot and tittle was fulfilled. So no, it doesn't work to place everything at the cross. And that, again, the, the futurist is the one arguing that there are necessary things to be fulfilled in the future. So then they, by their own argument, are proving that it wasn't all fulfilled at the cross. Otherwise, why does more need to be done? Uh, and that's where you know these conversations get very perplexing. What we're pointing out is that, no, when Christ said it is finished on the cross, it's important to understand how that was a part of the process of atonement in regards to the people of God. And that it was only through, again, you take out the cross, you have no reason for the high priest to go in. So the, again, the cross is very important. However, if you take out the high priest having to come out, there's no reason for the cross. So hopefully we see that's the point of this process. That's ultimately what Tim, Tim King, I'm sorry, Max King was getting at with his book, The Cross and the Parousia, was showing the importance of these two correlating events. One without the other doesn't make good sense or good nonsense for that matter. So I hope this was edifying to you. I encourage you to visit the power of preterism.wordpress.com. We'll continue to come out with insights. Look forward to tomorrow's time that we're going to be spending with Reese Maggard, again, one of the speakers at the recent Rethinking the Resurrection Conference. You can go ahead and review his message and all the details from that conference by visiting our blog as well. Thank you for being a part of our session. If I may close you close us out this morning with a brief benediction, I'll close with the benediction we read in our common prayer on Monday mornings. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And that will be tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Go in peace. God bless.